Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Set Theory seminar at the Graduate Center. Um, so today's speaker is uh, Adrian Macias uh, from the Université de la Réunion, and he is going to uh, speak about linking descriptive set theory to symbolic dynamics. Right. Um, right, I've prepared far too many slides, but I've got next week as well to so I'll see how far I get um, now is that right that's good uh, the original problem so can you hear me all well it's all good yes yes, yes. good um, right I was invited to Barcelona by Joan Bagaria in 1993 and stayed there three years very happily and at the drinks party at the start of that year, 93, Moira Chas, who I think she's from Argentina, um, I got chatting to her and she told me of an iteration question in compact metric spaces, which appeared to involve countable ordinals. And in Cambridge, I'd recently heard a talk in which somebody said that strange attractions are analytic. Oh, help, I'm getting oh, help, I'm get oh. Let me just see if somebody doesn't seem to be muted. Uh, could everybody make sure they are muted other than the speaker? Let's see. I think everybody seems to be muted. Let's see what's happening. Uh, um, I'll mute myself again and we'll see if it works better. Right. Uh, so on the screen, I've got the paper by three people. It's dated 1999, but there's a big delay in publication. And they were working on a question. And as I said, when I heard that strange attractors were analytic sets, uh, I realized set theory might have a contribution to make. So they sent me a draft of their work so far. And I found they didn't really know very much set theory and they were making elementary mistakes. So I was able to correct some of those and then prove results of my own. And Recently, I've had more ideas, and the point of these talks really is to encourage somebody else to have a look at these papers, because the dynamics group said they couldn't understand my solution to their problem, so they were going to think about something else. Very disappointing. Right, so if X is a Polish space and F a continuous function, these are standard definitions, the omega limit set set of points Y is such that as you iterate F, X repeatedly comes arbitrarily close to Y. It's not good enough if it just equals Y once or so. Uh, it'd have to be periodic for that to count. And it's a closed subset. And uh, the dynamics group, they, they wanted to work in compact metric spaces. What I found was that my ideas worked happily without requiring compactness. On the other hand, um, I do at some point, metrizability is, is very helpful. So it's, some of the ideas work more generally than others. So having defined the omega limit set, you will look at, you would define an operator, this is, uh, and then a transfinite sequence. So omega f a is the points that a attacks, that's the word I've introduced, you'll get a definition soon. Um, a plus one is the points attacked by something attacked by a, and it goes on like that. So attacking is translative, and this is a shrinking sequence of sets, that's elementary analysis to check that. So, Set theorists know there'll be an ordinal where it stops shrinking, theta a f, and nothing more happens after that. So I write a of a f um, the final Ad set. Adrian, Adrian, so, excuse me. Could you just go back one page? I, I was too slow in parsing the definition of the sequence of the a's. Sorry, I just want to be able to follow right. a little bit. I see, okay. Uh, I see, okay, all right, thank you, thank you. Um, so the final set I called the abode and the ordinal 
saying how long it lasted before it stabilizes, I call the score of the initial point. Um, I think the Barcelona people call it the kernel and the depth, but they didn't talk to me much, so I used my own terms. <laughs> and what question they were interested in, this function theta of AF, what are its possible values? So the escape set is all the things which were attacked by A, but at some point they're eliminated um, during the iteration. So I write beta of XAF for the stage beta at which X gets pushed out. And the escape set are those which are pushed out eventually, the points of escape and the points that are in the final set, I say they abide. Now, as I say, my interest as a set theorist was aroused and eventually I came led to two papers, which I've put there. Uh, the numbering of my references is not the same as on the abstract list I sent in advance, but the details are. Um, so the big paper, Delays, Recurrence, and Ordinals, came out, took it years to get it published, but there it is, 2001. And that's the main paper. And then in Curacao, 1995, I contributed a paper, but couldn't last my father died that year, so I couldn't go to the Curacao meeting. Um, but the first idea I had was to focus not on the sets omega sub f of x, but to a binary relation, which I call attack. So x, if I want to name the function f attacks y, um, if for every open neighborhood of y, a set of iterations is infinite, a set of n such as f of n x is in g is infinite. And I've put some easy propositions there. If x attacks y and y attacks z, then x attacks z. That's transitive, easily checked, undergraduate analysis. And that confirms why the sequence I defined is shrinking. Um, and then another observation of x attacks A, then it also attacks the image of A under F, and also F of x attacks A. So you, if x attacks A, you can change the number of Fs used to any finite number on either side of that. And the omega limit set is exactly the set of y which x attacks. So I haven't lost anything from that problem, but the advantage of changing to this binary relation is that it's g delta in a second countable space and continuous function. So things like the Kuhn and Martin theorem can be used, and which is one of the first things I did, proving that the ordinal beta xaf is always countable. So any point which is going to escape does so at a countable stage, and therefore by stage omega one, the thing has stabilized. Now the Barcelona people th thought it would always, theta of AF would always be countable, rather like the Cantor Ben Dixon derivatives stop at a countable stage. Uh, and I, I thought that was true for a long time. And then, David Fremlin got, got me thinking that I was wrong to believe that. And um, after several more years work, I constructed a point which has score omega one. And it's, it's um, a hard proof, but I'm sure there are ideas in it which could be used elsewhere. So what I'm hoping to do, start this week and continue next week, is outline that construction. So here's some background reading, classics of Moscovarchus and Kekris and De La Cherie. Um, and then Kunin's classic paper. And next week, the paper by Andreas Blass has um, had a big influence on my approach to uh, what has also been an open problem in this area. Uh, but it won't, his ideas won't crop up this week. Um, and then you see I wrote three more papers, 
analytic sets under attack is the one with difficult construction. And there's two short papers um, published in Prague and choosing an attacker by a local derivation. Uh, well, I, I won't talk about it now, but there's a nice idea there. And in scenario for transferring high scores, I have a theorem saying a space which satisfies four conditions will have a point of score omega one. Alas, I have yet to find a space which satisfies all four conditions. So I would be delighted if somebody can show either that they don't exist or find one. Uh, then in reunion, my colleague Christian Delamay got interested when I was working on the difficult construction. And he, um, I haven't yet said what shift is, but that'll come. He, he found uh, some improvements in, in, uh, in some, of, some of my proofs. So, and he's written these three articles, but for some reason he doesn't, I fail to persuade him to publish them, which is a shame. So I hope somebody will raise their voice in that direction. And next week's talk, I, I mentioned this paper I found on the web, um, but the author said his interests have shifted away from, from that. But next week, it, um, that will be something I talk about. So uh, Barcelona wanted to look at compact metric spaces. My theorems, I need the traceability, but they don't have to be compact. And Andreas, in his classic paper, uses ultrafilters, which work very well when the space is compact, but he doesn't need the traceability. I know he's listening. I hope I haven't said anything false. But I want to explore the notion of uniform attack. It's like uniform recurrence. A recurrent point is one that attacks itself. And uniform recurrence has been much discussed. So I'm trying to explore the idea of uniform attack. <coughs> Now, uh, general notation, it's convenient to call the set of natural numbers both omega and n, because then I can write omega to the n for the ordinal power and n to the n of a set of intervals. And there are places where I want to look at n plus set of positive integers. And here's the definition of the shift function. If you've got sequences of length omega of members of some set, the shift throws away the first term and moves every other term up one. So you lose information. Some people call it the backward shift. Um, then the empty sequence, um, I use the same symbol, a different symbol from the empty set. That's just helpful. And uh, right, length of S for the length of a finite sequence. Um, and concatenation, so there's a standard. And just look at some preliminary ideas from delays. Um, I'm sure the audience know all about well-founded trees. And I'm interested in looking at trees where the nodes are themselves finite sequences. Um, uh, I can't tell you why yet, but I hope shortly I can say why that was very helpful. And closed under shortening means that an initial segment of a member of T is in T. So a non-empty tree closed under shortening contains the empty sequence. Well-founded, you know. And if you've got dependent choices, it's the same as saying there's no infinite path. Um, and given the well-founded tree, close on the shortening, you can define a rank function, as I've done that's familiar recursion. Um, and well, you, you have done that theorem a lot. So I put a lot of detail into the paper because I was hoping dynamics people would want to educate themselves. Um, and this proposition at the bottom of this slide, what a well-founded tree and S for every new S in the rank of the node S in T, there is a T below S um, of rank exactly new. Um, 
Now, I want to compare escape and well-foundedness. So essentially I'm going to associate to each point in the space a, well, a, a tree which might be well-founded and the, the point's going to escape if and only if the tree is well-founded, that's the idea. So this is an important definition. So I fix a, a starting point. I, I, I assume I fix the function f in the space x. I'll take a point a in the space. And now for each point b in the space, I'm going to define a tree t a b. And its nodes will be finite sequences. And a sequence is such that at the top is b, thinking of sequences of working up to the top, uh, it, it, as it goes up to the top, it, 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 the, it preserves a relation of attack. So, um, it's because I'm the shortening. And now I want to say B abides if and only if there's an infinite sequence, as I've shown, um, going up in the up or down. I, gosh, I've got to decide with up or down <laughs> in the attack relation. So if if there's an infinite sequence of attacks like that, um, each one at each stage of, of the iteration that I've described, each point it's gu gu guaranteed to be stay at that step xi by by it's it's the one that's attacking it. So, um, can you can you see my pointer? Yes, yes, we oh, can. Yeah. Nice. Um, that's good. That's, uh, so, if x one has lasted to stage xi, um, it will last. You show that all of these last through every stage. Each of them guarantees continuation of it. Of, the others. So it's it's like modern politics, really, isn't it? <laughs> um, if the tree, if there's no such sequence, the tree is well founded, and then it erodes from the bottom. As you apply the iteration, the things which are not which are attacked by A but not attacked by anything attacked by A will disappear. There won't be an A1, big A1. And then that will create new bottom points and they gradually erode until you get up there. So it will show you that B will vanish at a very exactly computed ordinal. The so rank of that sequence in this tree um, and plus one. So it, it, that's when it disappears. So B abides if and only if Help escape, B escapes if and only if TAB is well founded. And the proposition that if it escapes, it escapes at a countable stage. I haven't got the proof here. Um, it, it's a corollary of a Kuhn and Martin theorem, and the proof is written out in careful detail in the paper. Um, so because the escape relation is G delta, what well, if a tree is well-founded, you've got a well-founded Borel tree, and that means its rank is going to be countable. And that does it. And that corollary I've already mentioned. So now, I think I mentioned the transitivity of attack and that, and that gives us Supposing I've got a B and there's an infinite sequence coming down to B naught of attacks and the point B attacks all of them. What I want to do is to insert here between B and all these a point Y, which is recurrent and attacks all the BIs. And the reason I can do it is because of this proposition here, proposition two, because it means I can I can change if I take yi to be f 
to ni iterating f ni times of bi, I can choose the integers ni so that this lot become a Cauchy sequence converging to a point. Um, it's, I found this proof, I first of all did it in the case of a shift function where it's easy and you can see what's happening. And then I thought I'll try and fuzz the proof and found that it didn't work for an arbitrary Polish space as the proposition says. And the proof, again, it's written out in detail. Um, right. So a point that I, of a sort I've built, I say why it lies at the end of that path. This is a path, infinite path. And the point such as the one I've said exists, I say it lies at the end. And if two, both Y and Z are at the end of the same path, they attack each other and are both recurrent. So if you've got a single equivalence class of recurrences. So I've said that for recurrent point is a point that attacks itself and trivial examples to show they might not exist, but in a compact space, they do exist because essentially because that sequence I defined was shrinking, so it'll come down to something. Um, and you could do without a C if you know some set theory and use Schoenfield. Um, and now in a second countability, second countable space, you can't have a increasing or decreasing sequence of closed sets of length omega one, because you've got a countable base. So easy proof. And I mentioned this result, which I learned about from Stavo to that Hausdorff proved that you can't, similarly cannot have a uncountable sequence of delta naught two sets. And that shows that the bare space, S, S is a shift function, uh, it can't be signal or two. Uh, I said I spotted a misprint there. Uh, what am I proving there? Oh, um, 3.2. I would say uh, to prove our current points exist. So this is the proof. Um, I, I careful to pick a shrinking sequence of closed sets. Um, I have to choose them each time I do a shrink, I talk for another one. And the process has to stop before omega one. And then I found the recurrent point. And points Z like that, or the omega limit sets are, are called minimal. And the dynamics people, that paper particularly I mentioned, there's a lot about minimal orbits. Um, now, I found in course of exploring this area, a notion of maximal orbits. And I haven't managed to get the dynamics people who are interested in maximal sets. So, but I'll show you why they exist. Um, so from what I've done so far, I've actually proved, well, I've <laughs> told you it's true that I've left you to check the proofs from getting the papers. Um, Something is in the abode if and only if it's attacked by a um, recurrent point attacked by a. And in one of those two short papers, um, I describe a way of definably choosing a B like that. Uh, but I won't mention it more today. Now, maximal recurrent points. So this proposition repeats what I've said that I can, I can vary the indices MI arranged so that this is a Cauchy sequence, get a limit point, and then I've got a recurrent point where I want. And that the remark is repeating what I said, that they attack each other. So therefore I look at a call point maximum recurrent if it's attacked by A, and if any 
C attacked by A attacks B, then B attacks C. And you get that by picking such a B, asking, is it maximal? If not, move to a one which is bigger. Now you get an ascending chain of closed sets, and that will stop as well. Uh, so that is easy. Um, and uh, 3.24, Birkhoff had a notion of um, non-wandering points, and it's the closure of a set of recurrent points, but it's not the same as what I call the abode, there are counterexamples. Now, how are we doing? Oh, we're doing well. Um, so now I want to aim to constructing points whose score is any given countable ordinal. And I'm going to work in bare space with the shift function. So infinite sequences of natural numbers with the shift function. And it's, um, that is not too bad once you've got, got organized. Then I try to do it for compact space, say Cantor space, two to the omega. I could, I did manage to get it to be seven, to work in seven to the omega. And I thought if I worked terribly hard, I could get down to three symbols, but I really couldn't face it. And then fortunately, Delomay found a way of transferring, um, embeddings from bare space into Cantor space, where the score of the point will change by at most one. So uh, I recommend his papers. If only he would publish them. I'll ask him if, if he will let me circulate them. Um, so, so if I've got an ordinal eta, T eta set of all strictly descending sequences of ordinals, but um, less than eta. So you turn that in a natural way into a well-founded tree. And what I want to do, um, I can also do the same if I start from a linear ordering, which I didn't know was well-founded. A lot of this will work there. But I'm then going to get into the arena of pseudo well-orderings, uh, which I'm going to avoid today. But uh, I think that ought to be looked at as, as um, uh, so I'm describing here how to convert that tree into a tree um, with, what I'm trying to do is to embed arbitrary countable well-founded trees into the attack relation. And this is the key lemma. So then I've got a tree and for each node of a tree, I found a point X sub S in the space X and X sub big T is a global point which is going to attack all the excesses. And as you go up the tree there, X S attacks X T. And then that will tell me that X S lasts at least to the ordinal row T S and very probably it will give up the ghost then. But at least I know, I've now got, if I start from a, a well-founded tree with rank some large countable orthogonal, I know how to cook up points in bare space. I haven't said how to do it. I'm afraid you have to read the details, which are a bit, they, they are actually not too bad, but writing them out is tedious. <laughs> Um, so it's convenient to have this notion of B is near to X, which a lot of the time will mean that finitely many shifts or function F apply, iterations of F applied to X get you to B. Um, a lot of time, then this is a slightly looser way of doing it. Right, that's, oh. 
that's just a checking by induction that something I want to happen does uh, does happen, and that confirms that in the provided I can set up these points, then I'll get a point of score of these rank bigger than the rank of the top point in that tree. Um, so here I'm just saying that um, Delamay conversion for the compact spaces, he does it much better than I did. Um, and um, he knows much more analysis than I do. So, right. So now to give concrete examples, those work in bare space of a shift function. And there is a, for every countable ordinal, there's a point of score that ordinal. Um, if zeta is a limit, countable limit ordinal, it gets a bit awkward. And particularly if you're trying to do it in Cantor space, a compact metric space, because there's an overspill phenomenon happening to get in the way. Um, but it, it is possible. Uh, but that's why I was lucky to start in an incompact case where it's easy to see what's happening. Um, I just want to draw attention to this sign. Uh, when I'm looking at infinite sequences of symbols, this means that U is a, is a segment. So no gaps, U is xk to xk plus m for some k and m. And if x attacks y, and u is a segment of y, then u occurs infinitely often as a segment of x. So if you want to cook up um, an x which attacks y, but such that y does not attack x, what you need is what I call a marker, which is a symbol which doesn't occur at all in Y. And then for X, you take increasingly long segments of Y, initial segments they could do, and between each of finite length, and then you put a marker in each time, uh, infinitely often. And then Y can't attack X because the markers don't occur in Y. But because you're making these segments infinitely long, you're going to get X attacks Y. Because think of a, a large finite segment of Y, you, you've got to throw away stuff at the beginning to, till in X you come to a segment that long or even longer and then throw away a bit of that initial segment there, then you've got exactly U. So that's the idea. So in bare space, it's very easy to, um, to, to build this family of points preserving at the attack relation. Ah, now I thought I'd put some open problems now. Um, uh, James Cummings asked, is score a pi 1 1 norm? Um, I think, I think that's still open, but um, you may have to restrict attention to a space where there are no points of score omega 1. And then it, it looks all sense. If points have score omega 1, there may be some pathology. Um, and what are the possible scores under shift of recursive members? Um, well, if you've agreed with everything I've said and score, I can get the score of a point to be any recursive ordinal. And the way I construct these trees is, is very effective. So I can claim that the beta I get of score, a given recursive ordinal is itself recursive. Um, then there's a paper by Kreisel um, on the Cantor-Bendixson theorem, where he shows there's a recursively coded closed set whose Cantor-Bendixson sequence stops at the first non-recursive ordinal. And inspired by that, I imitated his argument and found a recursive point whose score is the first non-recursive ordinal. And then in the hard paper, which I need to start talking about, I've constructed a recursive point 
who score is omega-1. Are there any others? And I, I don't think I know enough recursion theory to attack this question, but I ought to try learning. But I have a candidate for a counterexample, possibly omega-1 to the L. I'm just thinking of the Gaspari Kekris work on pi one one sets um, with no perfect subset and um, how that property is preserved. So you might expand the universe and then I just think it's possible there's a, a point of score omega one to the L in L. And when you do the expansion, um, it avoids getting wrecked. But I don't know, that's just a suggestion of mine. And as I've said, the notion of uniform current point has been much studied. Um, and is there a reasonable definition of X uniformly attacks Y? So I had a research student in the Réunion who started looking at this question. And then alas, I'm afraid he was taken ill and died rather you know, much too young. Um, so um, uh, it'd be very nice to think that something he was thinking about could be brought out. Now let's look at preparations for a point of uncountable score. Um, and now what I'm going to use here is a coding of finite trees, which was suggested to me by Delamay. I got a proof that there's a point of uncountable score, but it left me feeling like Alistair Lachlan in his monstrous priority paper, O triple jump priority argument, when he says he doesn't know why the proof works. It was the result of curing many false proofs and <laughs> he didn't have the energy to do any more on it. And then of course, Leo Harrington found a way of rewriting the proof, which made it more uh, easier to believe. And participants can now see your application. What is that? Which application are we seeing? Uh, <laughs> nothing has changed uh, on my side. I can just still see your, oh, I see. Uh, your paper. Yeah. Um, I don't know what that was about, but I'm being protected from <laughs> uh, bandits, I don't know. Um, so um, after I've outlined the proof, so uh, what my idea was, was this, I've shown you how the idea of constructing points of countable score, large countable score in bare space, and I was going to use a lot of markers. So. In any particular case, I was only aiming at a countable tree. Um, and I would only need, uh, I only had a countable alphabet. Now, if you want a point of uncountable score, it's going to attack points of score, arbitrary large countable ordinals. And the danger is you find yourself needing an uncountable alphabet. Well, then you haven't done what you're aiming for. So in order to just use a countable alphabet, the idea was um, you arrange everything as a tree. You're, work, you're, in, in, you're putting points on the nodes of a tree and the points will be symbols using an alphabet. But what the alphabet is will change as you go along any two different paths that the two alphabets they use we only have finitely many symbols in common. So it's like looking at branching, you know, almost disjoint things. And so that's why I have to define the alphabet as I, as I grow along the tree. And this is where the fun begins. So, um, so are you, where have I got? sequence u. So I look at finite sequences and I want curly f, it's a set of finite sequences uh, of natural numbers, but the domain of u is starts from one and 
for each i in the domain, u of i must be less, strictly less than i. So this is Christian Delabay's simplification of what I had before, and it certainly is um, a lot better. Um, but I did pass like that, and I passed through several wrong proofs before I got the right one. And then fortunately, Christian could help me to get a one that could be actually written down. Um, now, a positive U sequence. Um, we're going these U, these sequences U in curly F. We're going to interpret them as finite trees, and the U sequences are going to be paths through these finite trees. So what I'm going to generate is a growing sequ a sequence of growing finite trees, um, each making end extensions, and also a, a chosen path. The path might be, might stop or it might grow all the way to infinity, but each the U sequences are going to mark particular paths. So we read an element of U as coding a finite downwards branching tree. So let's take, here's, this example is very important. Uh, take the sequence, oh bother, sorry, what have I done? Ah, I see when I click, ah, where's it gone? When I click with my pointer, the slide changes. Um, I must not do that. So, the domain is one, two, three, four, five. So zero goes to one goes to zero, two goes to zero, three goes to two, four goes to one, five goes to zero. So what we've got is this tree. The top is always zero, one goes to zero, two goes to zero, five goes to zero, four goes to one, three goes to two. So you see, I, I've use that sequence to code a tree. Um, so this particular tree, the U sequences are the empty sequence. I don't keep putting zero in at the beginning. I just one, two, five, one, four, two, three. So each sequence is a path through the tree. It might get out to an end point or like this, it, it doesn't. Um, but this is uh, this is the coding to be used, and um, now our point. We're going to end up with countably many symbols. It's going to be the space of infinite sequences of symbols, and this is very important. There are going to be three kinds of symbols. I've called them recorders, predictors, and markers. So. Certain symbols contain information, either an element of U, they'll call just recorders, or a pair of U, uh, a sequence U in F, and a positive U sequence. So that's just naming a finite tree, and this is naming a finite tree with a, a path through it. Um, so these symbols, U, S, and U, are going to, I call them predictors, because they, as you will see, contain information about the near future of the infinite sequence. And the markers just can be anything you like, as long as they're different from all the recorders and predictors and each other. Uh, so it's extremely important that each symbol is a single object and we encase each symbol in square brackets. There's pointed brackets to encase finite infinite sequences of symbols. And we shall associate to each record and each predictor two natural numbers, its weight and its height. Right, so learn these definitions. A recorder is an object U where U is an F, its weight is zero and its height is the length of U as a member of F. So F, you know, curly F is finite sequences of the kind I've stated. A predictor is a pair S, U, 
U is in F and S is a positive U sequence. So I call S the path of a predictor and U is its tree. And the weight is the length of its path, the height is the length of its tree. So the weight can't be more than the height. And S is tight in U if S is a U sequence and the greatest thing in S is actually the length of U. So in the example I gave, the sequence ending in five will be tight. So in fact, we could call the looseness of U over S as its length minus the greatest thing in S. So now I'm going to define a finite sequence of symbols. Uh, and I proceed by a mode of induction I call double induction. So we first take the case S is the empty sequence. And then we suppose that M is greater than equal to one. We've already treated all pairs U, S with S a U sequence length less than M. And uh, we're going to then define Z, U, S in that case. And this definition, very convenient, S primed is S with the last element removed. So it's the empty set of S as a length one. And U primed is U with its last element removed. And now this is the definition. So first for S is the empty sequence, Z, U, S is progressively longer initial segments of U. So in the case with U is 00210, it's north, 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 two, north, north, two, one, north, north, two, one, north. Um, and if S is a positive U sequence, we define ZUS to be this predictor followed by SUS primed if max S is length of U, and otherwise if the max of S is less than the length of U. So this is when S is tight in U, this is when it's loose. It's SU primed S. That's well defined because of this condition, then that predictor then Z U S prime. And you must note key part of the proof that's coming is that S U is um, only occurs once and in this finite string of symbols and we call it the peak of Z U S because it's the only symbol in Z U S with sum of weight and height equal to maximum. Now, here are some examples. I, I put them in the paper because I find when I'm having to think about this, it's a great help to look through these examples I, to remind me how these definitions work. So if S is of length one, got that. So here, that's the case with max S was five, which was the length of U. So it's that. Whereas ZU2 is longer. Um, and it gets worse and worse. <laughs> Luckily, I've nearly used up all my time, but um, these are more. So you would see it grows enormously. Um, and I haven't done. <laughs> uh, perhaps the proof that P is not equal to NP is buried in this somewhere. Um, so if T is fairly loose in V with the supposition, then ZVT looks like that. So it has four predictors of weight equal to the length of T. And all the other predictors in these bits here will be of lesser weight. So there's the proof of first sum of ZUS if S is not empty is that predictor. Um, well, they're easily checked once you've got these definitions. Um, and there's repeating that notation, I didn't have to do that again. 
these properties of finite sequences I've probably said before and telling you about how if two things with the same path are equal, they are actually ZVT and ZUT when V equals U, and you've got this comparison there. Um, and the M predictor is predictive weight exactly M, and the M stretch is a sequence of symbols all of weight at most M. So if I've got S, a new sequence of weight bigger than M, and a stretch, M stretch in ZUS, then it is an M stretch in ZUS primed. In fact, you can be more exact and say that. Uh, I went boil with the proof. Um, so any two recorders in ZUS cohere, one will be an initial segment to the other. Um, in final segments, an occurrence of SU and SVT is followed by, uh, well, again, you just examine the definitions and the double induction that I illustrated is how to do the reasoning. Um, oh, this one, the, yes, just draw your attention, this is a, the immediate success of an M predictor is a symbol of weight M minus one. So that follows some previous things I haven't, but this lemma is important. And we come That dilemma, I think, is important because I put it in red. And now this proposition tells you first. So there's a lot of predictability about it, but there's also room for by like, choosing different paths for things to branch. And now this is the most important proposition. In any ZUS, if the same symbol of weight M occurs twice, between the two occurrences, there must be an occurrence of a symbol of weight M plus one. Um, so this is going to tell us eventually that a recurrent point uh, where so some symbol occurs infinitely often, the weight is going to be infinity, it must have things of arbitrary large, and that will characterize recurrent points when I get there, they won't be this week. Um, so the, the indicated symbol phrase I learned from Gandhi, symbol which occurs twice, it can't be the peak which only occurs once. So if it's tight in you, they're both in ZUS primed, and we're back at an earlier case, because S prime is shorter than S. Otherwise, ZUS is ZU primed S, the peak, and then ZUS primed. And there are three possibilities. Both occurrences before the peak, which case they're both there in ZU primed S, both after the peak or in ZUS primed. In both cases, that we've got a reduction to an earlier case, or one here and one there, but then the peak is of greater weight than either. Um, and we've said if the peak would be of weight greater than M, and if it's not M plus one exactly, it will be followed by the lemma I pointed out, step by step, you get down to a symbol of weight M plus one. Right, and now I, um, gosh, I've done better than I thought. Um, uh, so to form the infinite sequence, so third, we have infinitely many markers, and curly Y is going to leave a space for all sequences of length omega of symbols. So the symbols are recorders, predictors, and markers. Um, and we're going to look at sequences. We only, um, here we're back at sequences starting domain at zero and use the shift function. This is near to mean zeta is finite to many shifts of xi. 
and the weight of a point will be defined to be the supremum of the weight of its predictors, either a natural number or infinity, and similarly the height of a point is the supremum of its height of its recorders and predictors, again either a natural number or infinity. And now here comes the recursive B. So I enumerate all the sequences zeta, ZUS as I've defined, U's in curly F and S are U sequence. And then I just concatenate them. Any order will do as long as it's recursive. And I don't have to make them repeat because each repeats in others often so enough. And then I put one mark in between each case. And the big theorem is that the score of this point B is omega one. Huh. Well, it's nine o'clock. <laughs> um, okay. um, <laughs> uh, right. So right. we're done for today. <laughs> right. So, so shall I stop sharing and just see? Um, well, um, let's what do you want me to do? Uh, I, I think sometimes people have questions where it makes sense to pull up the slides again. Let's just okay. see if that's the case before you stop sharing. Yeah. Right. Um, does, okay. Are there are there any questions? I have a, 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 a linguistic question. It might be a bit frivolous, but um, it is a question. As I remember it, I, I, in your talk, you talked about you mentioned S prime. Oh, yes. as, I, as I remember it, Brits, didn't Brits use to say S dash? Yes, you're, you're dead right. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm, I've been corrupted by visiting the US. <laughs> and in fact, wow. Cookinghorn, who taught me in um, Cambridge, had uh, obviously spent some time. He, 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 I learned saying prime from him, actually. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So I learned something. <laughs> and Good. and the double prime was double dash. Oh. <laughs> yes, that, that's good. <sighs> okay, any any further questions? I have to say, for me, I thought it was all very interesting, but I can't really, I feel like I have to go back and uh, watch everything at half the speed or yes. something like that. It's just too much uh, to take in and, and ask reason, for me, ask a reasonable question afterwards. <laughs> I'd recommend getting at the actual papers and right. uh, yeah. they are available. Um, but the Generally, what I found was that there was a simple idea, but getting the details to work was long and tedious. But... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for this talk. It was uh, really nice. I thought nice ideas. Um, and uh, I guess I'll stop recording unless there are any further questions. Oh, and I Andreas think... has a remark or question. I'm, I'm only applauding, not raising my hand. Oh. <laughs> that, hand, that hand is applause. Question <laughs> <laughs> oh. hands are like this, and applause hands are like that. Oh, I see. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I, I have a question. I have a question for you, Andreas. 